We are marking tonight the 25th anniversary of the very special Canada Prizes. And the Canada Prizes, of course, are awarded every year by the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, which this year marks its own 75th anniversary year. That's three quarters of a century during which it has contributed so significantly to the academic, cultural, and intellectual life of our nation. Indeed, the Federation has flourished so well, it now has a membership of 160 universities, colleges, and various scholarly associations, representing 85,000 researchers and graduate students right across Canada in both official net languages. On a brief personal note, as a journalist during recent decades, of increasingly complex and unprecedentedly rapidly, rapid change, I become increasingly concerned about our society's pressing need to bring deeper study and more context, in a sense more ballast, to our sense of time and events. Fortunately, we do have the Federation. At its core, the Federation promotes research and deeper understanding of those contributions made by the humanities and social scientists towards an open and democratic society. And I know all of you will agree that those are contributions we must not lose sight of or take for granted. They so much define who we are in this time of such challenging ferment and change. The Canada Prizes are important. One of the most, one of the most significant awards for nonfiction writing in Canada. Each year, four books are chosen. There are two in English covering the categories for the humanities and social sciences, and two in French in these same categories. Each receives a prize of $2,500 and is chosen by a very distinguished panel of scholars and public intellectuals. The Canada Prize is also linked to a remarkable program of the Federation. All eligible books have received funding from its Awards to Scholarly Publications program, ASPP, which was started in 1941 by a group of public intellectuals that included, talk about prestigious, Harold Innes and Northrop Frye. Since that wartime launch, the program has funded the publication and translation of more than 6,000 books. So to be chosen, Canada Prize winners clearly need to stand out. As expressed by the Foundation, the award-winning books, quote, make an exceptional, exceptional contribution to scholarship, are engagingly written, and enrich the social, cultural, and intellectual life of Canada. For this special anniversary event, the Foundation has partnered, with, has partnered with York University and the Toronto Public Library. I'll mention in passing that, as you probably have noticed, the books of winners and, and, and those contestants are on sale at the back, courtesy of the University of Toronto Press. But now it is my very great pleasure to introduce Stephen Toop, the, pres the new president of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Stephen, as most of you know, has been in the news of late. In January, he was also named the new director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, a scholarly body I'm proud to be associated with as a, as a fellow. For nine years before that, Stephen was president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia and overall has had an extraordinary academic and legal career president of the Pierre Trudeau Foundation, and dean of law, McGill University. All the while, been involved at home and abroad in issues of human rights and international law. Please welcome Stephen Tu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for that uh, warm welcome. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Je m'appelle Stephen Toop et je suis président de la Fédération des sciences humaines. I want to say how pleased I am to be here with you today at the Toronto Reference Library for this wonderful occasion. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Aboriginal land on which the library operates. It's been the site of human activity for some 15,000 years. 
This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Pitoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. As you heard, and briefly, the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences promotes research, learning, and an understanding of the contributions made by the humanities and social sciences to a free and democratic society like the one we are blessed to live in in Canada. It was established during the Second World War, right at the beginning in 1940. Imagine that moment, the sense of concern, the sense of uh, nervousness, and yet, at the same moment, an optimism that the humanities and social sciences could still speak to populations at war. One of the key activities, as you heard from Brian Stewart, is the Awards to Scholarly Publications program, also known as the ASPP. Each year, that program offers 185 grants, totaling roughly $1.5 million, to support the publication of Canadian scholarly books that make an important contribution to knowledge in the humanities and social sciences. Frankly, many of these books couldn't be published without this program. That is hugely important for us to recognize, and I want to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for its continuing funding for that program. But of course, tonight, the focus is upon a select group of winners, the Canada Prize winners. These prizes awarded annually, not only to books that are the best or perceived to be the best in the humanities and social sciences, but that also have received funding from the ASPP and that are written in a manner that is engaging and available to audiences. Le Prix du Canada consacre des œuvres qui ont apporté une contribution exceptionnelle à la, à la recherche, sont rédigés de façon engageante et enrichent la vie sociale, culturelle et intellectuelle du Canada. On behalf of the Federation, I want to thank this year's jurors for the countless hours of reading, deliberation that they took to reach what have been, uh, I think, a wonderful uh, collection of prize winners. I'd also like to acknowledge the representatives from our sponsors who are here this evening. Mr. Kevin Gormley, partner at Boyden Global Executive Search, Lori Rennie from Marquis, and Jean-Paul Boudreau, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at Ryerson University, as well as representatives of this year's winners, publishers, and universities. Thank you for your support and for attending this evening. And now it is my pleasure and honor to pass the podium to my colleague and friend, Dr. Mamdou Shukri, president of York University, with whom the Federation is partnering to present this evening's ceremony. Dr. Shukri. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Good evening, everybody. It is indeed my great pleasure to welcome you all to this wonderful event on behalf of York University. York's partnership with the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences for this wonderful event is an honor and a privilege. And I have to say, it is a partnership that makes a great deal of sense. At York, we take immense pride in being internationally renowned in the quality of our research and education in humanities and social sciences. In fact, this past year, we ranked among the top 100 institutions in the world in both of these fields. And for the last few years, York significantly increased its share of large grants in humanities and social sciences. Another factor that makes York's involvement with the Canada Prizes a natural fit. It is the university's long-standing commitment to mobilizing knowledge for public good. At York, we are deeply committed to social justice. It is central to our foundation. And since our, our early foundations, York's researchers in humanities and social sciences have written the book, sort of 
of sp to speak on issues on social justice in society. The books we are celebrating tonight reflect the best of the latest in a long tradition of excellence. We are proud to partner with the Toronto Public Library to honor these books and authors, and in this public way, and to a wide audience of readers, which is very much in keeping with our commitment of sharing our knowledge and knowledge mobilization. And now I have a very special privilege of calling on tonight's keynote speaker to say a few words to you. I think Brian will introduce him first, isn't it? Uh, it's me, okay. So our keynote speaker is M.G. Fasanji. He's a writer of unique range and skill, one who holds both a special place in Canadian literature and is globally renowned. Among his many awards, I'm proud to note that in 2005, he received an honorary degree from York University. His significant contributions to literature and to the enrichment of our social, cultural, and historical understanding make him the perfect speaker for tonight's event. So please join with me in welcoming M.G. Fasanji. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shukri. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to speak uh, to such an audience. Uh, I, I must admit I feel like a bit of an interloper uh, because the relationship of uh, the humanities or at least academics to, to the creative arts is, is, exists in a bit of a uh, state of tension, uh, one, one assumes, uh, or one hears. Just this morning I read a uh, Saul Bellow's relationship with the literature department in Chicago, and it wasn't very great. But in any case, what I want to talk about is uh, something that's based on my experience, and I believe maybe uh, has to do with, uh, with the humanities, which uh, has become, although my, my own background starts in science, uh, the history and literature, of course, have been very much a central part of my existence in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Now, I, I, it's, just, it's fair to say that history uh, does not seem important to us when we are young. You know. It's a subject uh, that I, I think I would speak for many young people is, is hated. You know. And because you don't care about you know, who did what and when and where at that point, because you're interested in the now and uh, perhaps uh, if your parents have a say in the future. But the past doesn't matter. But, so I would like to speak about what, uh, how it uh, began to matter to me and how I came to articulate that the importance of history to my life and to my work uh, as a novelist. When I wrote my first novel, uh, which was called The Gunny Sack, uh, and was asked, sometimes you get asked to speak about it, and you know, I would often start by repeating an adage that I invented as a student of physics, that what is not observed does not exist. What is not seen is not there. And if you've done even a little bit of physics, you will know that, you know, uh, you know physicists may postulate the existence of a particle, but you know, then they may go searching for it for decades. But if it's not discovered, it's not there. Now, I don't want to take that observation too far or start qualifying it, because otherwise I'll get myself worked up into knots. You know? But uh, what I mean to say is that groups or societies that have not been observed do not exist in the world's imagination. And I had two particular situations in mind, one that of many non-Western small nations about which the world remains largely ignorant, and two of what I have called small people, people who do not belong to any mainstream, that is to any of the larger groups in the world that define histories, cultural trends, political opinions, etc., in the world as well as within a nation. And if these small people and nations don't tell their stories, who is going to do so? And what are they going to say? What is not seen can, of course, be imagined or inv invented or perverted. 
If you don't observe yourself, if you don't tell your stories, write your own histories, study yourselves, you either don't exist in the world's eyes or what is worse, it sees, sees you as it wants to, invents you. You come from a place where lions are, you know, that kind of thing. This idea applied to me in two ways, you know, but first I, I speak just from my personal point of view. It, 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 it applied to me from a small people perspective because I come from a community of Indians in Africa that makes me already a minority in the margins. And moreover, to make my group even smaller and further removed from any mainstream, from a sectarian ethnic community. More than that, so to belong to the margins of the margins, I came from a community with syncretistic beliefs, so that in that case you are exactly nowhere. This is fine when you live in a closed, protected system, as we did. In fact, it's the perfect existence. But as soon as you emerge into the wider world, you realize that you are nobody. Nobody knows or can understand who you are, where you come from. Against your will, you are boxed into definitions. Against your will, those who represent you rewrite your history. History therefore becomes important. It becomes vitally urgent so that you can define yourself to yourself first and then to the world. You can tell the world I exist, this is what I am, understand me, don't look away or have a glaze on your eyes as if you were drunk. <laughs> Everybody comes from somewhere and although we don't make a big deal about this in North America, we, re we realize that most people know about their origins. Irish or Canadian, Irish or English, native or Indian, Chinese or Vietnamese. And in fact, if in the last few years, if you were addicted to the show Sopranos on TV, you know how conscious they were, even in the third generation, of where exactly in Italy they came from. So everyone has a sense of who they are, and even those who pretend they don't, it's because they come from England. <laughs> <You know? laughs> After all, what is Canadian culture? A good deal of it is European, you know. You look at the International Festival of Authors, you look at the opera, you look at the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, so at least the elite culture is European. So people have a sense of who they are. Now you may wonder what this has to do with, uh, with Canada, and I will come to that later if there is time. But when I began writing creatively, short stories and a novel, right here in Toronto, about half a mile from here, when I first arrived, I immediately realized this predicament. If I'm a nobody, how do I tell my stories in a comprehensible way and become somebody? Tell my stories so people know what I'm talking about. Who knows about what I write? Who knows the context? Why my characters take some things for granted and not others? It is silly. It is, it is lazy and complacent. It is arrogant and fatuous to say that you don't need a context. To say that a work of art is universal and is therefore understood everywhere. It is not. Of course there is a context. To give you a trivial example, when I read a novel called Regent Street, I know where it is. Most of the Western world would know it. Park Avenue, yes. How about Uhuru Street? And dare I say Young Street? <laughs> Most of the rest of the world doesn't know it. In fact, when I wrote my first novel and I, you know, I tried to get it published, I had to go to a Canadian publisher and I, you know, they told me to come back. And next time I went, I took a map with them, with me. So you, know, you need to tell people who you are and they have to understand who you are. And it can be done, of course, and in Canada especially. Obviously, you need a context. You need markers, images, even history. You need language registers. To quote the Scottish literary critic Herbert Grierson, a writer is connected with his audience by a body of common knowledge and feeling to which he may make direct or indirect allusion, confident that he will be understood. He knows roughly what his audience knows and what are their prejudices. This is crucial to those of us who come from outside and write novels and poetry and paint and make music. As a writer of fiction writing in Canada, I needed to bring my context here, my history, my assumptions. This affects how I write. It's not just telling people who you are. You have to do it in a certain way which does not seem obvious. So it affects the form of the work, the language of the work that I use. The South American writer Ernesto Sabata rather colorfully illustrated this predicament. A writer born in France finds, as it were, a homeland that already exists. 
In Latin America, he must write it at the same rate he creates it, like the pioneers of the far west who farmed the land with a gun at their side. Now, I don't favor the gun bit, you know. <laughs> it might land me in Guantanamo, but you, know. but you see what he's saying, that you are a pioneer and you're basically bringing your world to the world. And in fact, one can even make the observation, people tell you to write sparely, you know. There was a certain trend in the 1980s and 90s to write like Raymond Carver. Would Raymond, would, would Raymond Carver be understood where I came from? He would not. You know. And to be a little blasphemous, would Alice Munro be understood where I came from? She would not, you know. How do you write this homeland, make the reader aware that is the problem of the writer? But first, many a writer has to bring it to himself. If necessary, he has to invent it or mythify it. So it's so I sort of cut out a few bits. Uh, basically, so my situation when I left, my home country, Tanzania, my city, Dar es Salaam, which was my world, and that was the, the thing I existed in, was comfortable in, it nurtured me. It was a cocoon. And left my community, the Gujarati Kojas, for the United States, because that's where I first went. I immediately felt a sense of being historically adrift. Who was I beyond the superficial description of my passport? There was a need to orient myself in this larger world in which I found myself a need to be rooted in a place, in a history, as everyone else around me, as everyone else in the world seemed to be. Where and how did the small world I came from fit? I was now in the real world, the world I had read about in books and newspaper, the world of major historical events and figures, Vietnam, the world wars, the arms race, the space race, the Cold War, a world of great leaders, a world of great ideas in science, literature, music, and philosophy. And of course, a world which was turning topsy-turvy in the 1960s and 70s, which were automatically, even if you were an American or a Canadian, you were forced to ask, who are you and why are you what you are? You know, why not something else? But there appeared to be a comfort and confidence in belonging to a Western country and civilization in those who were around me that I myself could not possess. I had nothing to show. I had to understand my origins, define my identity. I said I was a Tanzanian, but you know, who understood where it was? I, I tried to make a phone call to my, to, uh, it was very hard to make phone calls in those days, you know, and very expensive. So I tried to call Tanzania, and what do I get? I get Tasmania. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> that exactly tells you, <laughs> you know, where you are in the world. So I said I was an African, but what kind of African? I had a tribe which is what I told myself, and that tribe was Indian. It was at that point that the Indianness I had been brought up with, defined by the small rituals, the stories of miracles, the, the devotional songs and spirituality, the miracles of flying holy men awoke in me. That's what I, I told myself who I was, my starting point, my raw data, if you will. But where did they fit? All these little things that I carried in me, which, which were so much a part of me, even to this day, the stories and songs and so on. Where did they fit in the world, in the universe of, uh, of existence, in the intellectual place I was in? And I tried to read a lot of uh, Indology, you know, Edward Zenner and you know, all kinds of stuff. And uh, so I read a lot, I asked a lot, I remembered a lot. I had to observe and to think and then to recreate. Thus my obsession with history, something that I didn't like because I was by nature more akin to science, where if you learned something, you could prove it. Whereas in history, you were just told what it is and it says why, you know. And of course, <laughs> you know, from that, history then became my main, uh, main obsession. Finding out who I was, what were the people and the place I came from, so I could give them a reality, make them, and, and in that sense, make them universal. Of course, a novelist does not become a professional historian. The itch to create is primary. And so the mere pursuit of history, of context, which is so illusory because it has to be created, itself becomes the subject of the novel or gives shape to the novel. It is in this sense that history becomes a phantom. There is always more. It is always revised. And you don't know when you stop. Perhaps this is where I should stop, but I have a little bit of a harangue that I would like to <laughs> add to my, my talk. 
And so what I've said, of course, applies to Canada, you know. We as Canadians have to know ourselves as an evolving nation of people. Otherwise, we are given an image, a stereotype. When I was in the, a student in the United States, Canada was the place where the cold fronts came, you know. So you look at the weather map and, you know, they show the United States and this is a space, cold front. <laughs> so, and, you know, in fact, so when I got a, a job, you know, in Chalk River, you know, just two hours drive from, uh, from Ottawa, I somehow imagined it was near the Arctic Circle, you know. So I told a lot of my friends, why don't you come skiing <laughs> for Thanksgiving, you know. And they all came for Thanksgiving, but there was no snow, you know. It was still, still a month or six weeks away. So that, in fact, was, what, and even now, you know, when you go to the United States, you go to some finance departments, you know, if they're going to give you a check. And they really don't know where Canada is. It's hard to believe, but it's true, you know. It happened to me just last month. But most of Canada, in fact, is not the North Pole or Corner Brook. It is urban. It has a thriving culture, which is itself is composed of many cultures. So Canada evolves, which is my second point. Its self-image evolves. I came here in 1978, but came to Toronto in 1980, and you know, the difference between then and now is just vast. You know? And I tell myself, this can only happen in this country. But also, I always say that the history of Canada is the history of its many peoples. Those who came earlier, and those who came later, and those who are still in the, on the airplanes. My history then is your history, and your history becomes mine. I've often thought about this sharing of history around, around about Remembrance Day. This always comes back to me. Remembrance Day, I say, what does it mean? It is touching, in fact, in November to see people come out wearing poppies in memory of those who were killed in two world wars abroad. The older people, especially whom I notice on a Toronto street, you know, I'm very aware, could have, been, could have lost a father or an uncle, you know. So it is, in, a, in some ways, a very moving sight. And sometimes school ceremonies, you know, it's not sometimes, every year school, school ceremonies rem mark Remembrance Day. But they, rem they mark Remembrance Day, at least in the school that my kids went to, using Christian and Jewish symbols and with reference to Europe. Now, there's nothing wrong in principle with that, you know. I mean, you're remembering you know, those people who passed away. Uh, in a war, whether you think it was justified or not. But surely, you tell yourself, or I tell myself, it would be good to be aware that even Africans and Indians fought in those wars. And there were Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and Christians and pagans and people of mixed religions. And now this is where it sounds risky. Wouldn't it be nice if we remembered all those who died in all the wars of, in any parts of the world? Or else, how are our, our children whose roots lie in Asia or Africa to relate to this symbolism? Except to raise their eyebrows and say, really? They have their histories too that don't quite match neatly with the histories of their schoolmates of European origin whose great grandfathers went to fight in the world wars. But Canada, as I said, of course, has, in recent years, has been especially receptive to these ideas as its population continues to grow and diversify. The new Canadian writer is for the most part, at least as long as he's alive, you know, accepted as a Canadian writer. You know, who knows, you know, you know, our generation is dead, you know, the next generation may call us, you know, sort of foreigners. At least for now, the new Canadian writer is accepted as a Canadian writer, extending the bounds of Canadian literature, rewriting notions of the country's past and the histories of its people and challenging and questioning its traditional symbols and representations. Of course, this does not happen without resistance. We all regret change, especially in the environment of our growing up and in our visions of our nation. And just to you know, bring it back to me, sometimes I meet people who tell me, have you gone back to Tanzania? Do you see how much it has changed? So they are very sad that it has changed. And all I tell them is, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> Everything changes. <laughs> There are always, therefore, those who will bring out their calipers to measure degrees of Canadianness. None more so, I dare say, than in the cultural fields. You know. But new Canadians arrive every year. The movement can only be forward and to the future. Thank you.
Thank you very much, M.G. Vasanji, for that truly interesting address. Thank you so much. And now it is uh, my distinct honor to present, along with Stephen Toop, the 2015 Canada Prize winners. To begin, the winners of the 2015 Canada Prize in the Humanities are Charlotte Townsend Galt, Jennifer Kramer, and Keek Ayin for Native Art in the Northwest Coast, A History of Changing Ideas, published by UB Press. I'd like to read from the jury's citation. Illustrated with artwork and photographs, Native Art in the Northwest Coast is a comprehensive archive of historical documents illuminated by well-crafted essays and prologues. The result is a treasure trove of information on Northwest Coast Native Art. It will be essential reading for all future work on the topic. The competition in this category was outstanding, for finalists also included Phyllis D. Earhart for A Church with the Soul of a Nation, Making and Remaking the United Church of Canada, published by McGill Queen's University Press. Jean Allen for Making National News, A History of Canadian Press, published by University of Toronto Press. Sandra Campbell for both Hands, A Life of Lauren Pierce of Ryerson Press, published by McGill Queen's University Press. And Stephen Hennigan for Sandino's Nation, Ernesto Cardinal and Sergio Ramirez, writing Nicaragua, 1940-2012, published by McGill Queen's University Press. And now the winner, Charlotte and Jennifer, please come forward to accept your award. Oh, it's a huge honor to be here. My daughter told me not to cry, and I'm really trying very hard. Um, I want to say first that our colleague Kikin, who uh, now goes by the name Chush Kamatni, he's uh, inherited a new name, couldn't be with us today, and we really regret this. His knowledge, eloquence, and his commitment to his own Nuchalnath culture has been a main driver of our work together over the years. His own line drawing of the Thunderbird on the title page, which he drew after listening to Anton Bruckner's Third Symphony in my home, vaults across the still, I'm sorry to say, horrible gulf that too often divides native and others. That thunderbird for us signals the direction to which the, which the book tries to take. And he wrote under the drawing, and as they lifted their voices and sang, <clears throat> the great thunderbird leapt from the floor and danced for them. Sorry. Jennifer Kramer is the third of us without whose energy this book could not have happened. I may have to fade away. <clears throat> I will just say that, as we know, a book is not to be judged by its cover, except this book. The gleaming shimmer of abalone shell has been used for centuries up and down the Northwest Coast to express power in every sense of that word. Northwest Coast native art is not about objects, but about values, and about the history of trying to understand and express those values and ideas. So this is not an art book in any conventional sense, and it embodies a kind of harangue. Thank you, M.G. Fasanji, for that word. Um, it's, you know, not straightforward, this story, and we need to be harangued, and we need to think critically, right? Rather, it reproduces and considers the many perspectives on what is called art that have been published, but also those that have been obscured by the volume of publications, the history of the values, and how the cultures of the coast have been expressed, interpreted, and misinterpreted over the last 300 years or so. The work of our 28 dedicated contributors has been driven by archive fever, scholarly acumen, and communication savvy. I'm delighted that Doug White and Andrea LaFourette are with us tonight. 
Amongst our contributors are historians, anthropologists, artists, art historians, experts in cinema and media, and the book simply wouldn't exist without their work. And now I want to say that we did not realize how much it costs to do a book like this. And the editors and UBC Press must gratefully acknowledge the financial support that we received from so many quarters. The Canada Council, the British Columbia Arts Council. This book, as you know, was published with the help of a grant from the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. It wouldn't be here either without the O'Dane Foundation for the Visual Arts in BC, the Audrey Hawthorne Fund for Publications at the UBC Museum of Anthropology, the Department of Anthropology, the Hampton Research Fund at UBC, the Keeley Foundation, Jack and Marion Adelaar. Their first $500 meant everything to me. The Michael and Sonia Kerner Charitable Foundation, the Michael O'Brien Foundation for the Arts, and the Millard Mice Publication Fund of the College Arts Association. Thank you to them all. We wouldn't be here without them. Jennifer, please don't cry. I promise I'll try not to. I'd just like to add, you should not sit down. <laughs> um, this anthology, a work of critical historiography, as Charlotte already said, could not exist without the scholarship and insight of our contributors. Each of the chapters is unique in theme, but also style and argument. It is this difference, even somewhat this incommensurability of values that makes this less a conclusive tome and more a work in progress. And that is exactly the point of this endeavor. Let me say that this was long in the making. During the process of producing this anthology, I had two babies. I have a very fond memory of Chuchumachni talking about the importance of walking when one is pregnant and passing on his grandmother's words about the importance of pregnancy and passing on who you are to your children, history being made. Um, my eldest will be turning 10 this Sunday, so that gives you a sense of how long this was in the making. And Charlotte um, had her first grandson when the book came out, was published, who basically weighed about as much as the book. So our lives are totally woven in the creation of this publication. And it was difficult, Charlotte especially, but all of us, it was difficult to send this manuscript off for its final publication. We kept thinking, but we have to add this, we have to add this, there has to be more. It doesn't stop, we can't put it to bed, so to speak. And we recognize that these conversations and the meaning making about art, perhaps better known as cultural belongings, history, are ongoing, perpetually incomplete. As a result, it was hard for us to stop, and we hope native art of the Northwest Coast will continue to stimulate. In the same way that Abalone's mother of pearl shell accrues layer upon layer upon layer as time goes forward, we're hoping this book will be debated and augmented, but actually, Really, what it needs to do is exist in a digital format so that it can continue to accrue meaning as these conversations continue and we grow together in Canada, indigenous and non-indigenous together. So, Justin, to end, thank you so much. We are so honored, the three editors and all of our contributors, to be receiving the 2015 Canada Prize in the Humanities. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Le lauréat du Prix du Canada en sciences humaines 2015 est Yann Amel.
pour l'Amérique, selon Sartre, littérature, philosophie, politique, publié par les presses de l'Université de Montréal. Un extrait des commentaires de jury. L'ouvrage de Jan Hamel permet de comprendre ce que fut l'Amérique dans la pensée de Jean-Paul Sartre, et plus largement pour toute une génération d'écrivains, de philosophes et d'intellectuels européens engagés. Dans ce livre ambitieux que les études sartriennes attendaient depuis longtemps, L'auteur parvient à sortir Sartre d'un anti-américanisme dans lequel la critique a confiné la gauche de l'époque. Les finalistes pour ce prix incluent, incluaient Stéphane Savard pour Hydro-Québec et l'État québécois, publié par l'édition de Centurion, et Sherry Simon, pour « Ville en traduction »,« Calcutta »,« Trieste »,« Barcelone » et « Montréal », publié par les presses de l'Université de Montréal. Yann, veuillez venir à l'avant pour accepter votre prix. Félicitations. C'est un honneur de recevoir ce prix ce soir. Il y a déjà plusieurs années, euh, bon, j'ai travaillé sur ce livre pendant sept ans, il y a déjà plusieurs années que je pense que euh, Jean-Paul Sartre et que son œuvre devraient être remises à l'avant-plan, non seulement dans les départements d'études littéraires et philosophiques, mais aussi dans l'ensemble des départements des sciences humaines. Et j'aimerais pouvoir croire que l'obtention de ce prix ce soir pourra contribuer un peu au moins à l'atteinte de cet objectif. Euh, il est plus important aujourd'hui que jamais, à mon avis, de trouver les moyens de réengager sur le plan politique la pensée, l'écriture, et la critique, et il me semble que Jean-Paul Sartre peut nous donner les moyens, les voies euh, de trouver euh, comment réengager la pensée de cette façon-là et comment la communiquer euh, le plus largement possible. Je voudrais bien sûr remercier euh, le prix d'aide à l'édition savante, sans lequel le livre n'aurait pas existé, la Fédération canadienne des sciences humaines qui honore aujourd'hui ce livre. Je remercie aussi les presses de l'Université de Montréal qui ont cru au livre et qui ont fait avec moi, comme ils le font avec tous leurs auteurs d'ailleurs, un magnifique travail d'édition. Le livre ne serait pas d'une aussi grande qualité sans eux. Je remercie la TELUC, euh, l'université euh, où j'enseigne, la TELUC, qui offre à ses chercheurs des conditions de travail tout à fait exceptionnelles grâce auxquelles le projet a pu aboutir. Euh, J'espère que la TELUC pourra continuer dans les années à venir à offrir de telles conditions à ses professeurs-chercheurs. Je remercie enfin la North American Sartre Society et la société sartrienne, le groupe, pardon, le groupe d'études sartriennes de Paris, qui ont toujours été des lieux accueillants, des lieux d'échange stimulants, grâce auxquels j'ai pu développer les idées qui euh, m'ont euh, permis de concevoir et de rédiger ce livre. Et merci à vous tous d'être ici présents ce soir. The winner of the 2015 Canada Prize in the Social Sciences, Sciences is Michael Ash for On Being Here to Stay, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights in Canada, published by the University of Toronto Press. Here's what the jury had to say. On Being Here to Stay is a rigorously documented and brilliant dissection of Canada's troubled relations with its native peoples. It is hard to think of a more timely book or a more important domestic issue for Canadians. It is accessibly written in a way that will enlighten anyone interested in this critical aspect of our history and its impact on contemporary events. The finalists in this category also included Caroline Debien for Power from the North, Territory, Identity, and the Culture of North Hydroelectricity in Quebec, published by UBC Press. Erica Dyke for Facing Eugenics, Reproduction, Sterilization, and the Politics of Choice, published by University of Toronto Press. Elizabeth Sheehy 
for Defending Battered Women on Trial, Lessons from the Transcripts, published by UBC Press, and Ron Williams for Landscape Architecture in Canada, published by McGill Queen's University Press. Michael, please come forward to accept your award. Good evening. Um, I'm deeply moved to have had my book selected for the Canada Prize. It's a singular honor to have a book recognized for such an award by a jury of fellow academics, and especially one as distinguished as the one that judged this book. It's an award that I will cherish. I would like to recognize first and foremost the important work of the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences, and especially the Awards to Scholarly Publications program. In these difficult times, your support is so crucial to ensuring that our scholarship reaches a broader audience and that publishers of such work can remain viable. I only hope that funders will soon recognize the importance of this program, thereby enabling more publications to reach the public. I also wish to acknowledge the support I have received from the University of Victoria since I retired early from the University of Alberta in 1998 and moved there. As many of you know, it is important for an academic, especially one who seeks continued engagement and scholarship, to have an academic home. And the university, particularly through the Department of Anthropology and the Faculty of Social Science, has done just that. I also wish to thank my publisher, the University of Toronto Press, for maintaining faith that I would complete this manuscript, for which a contract was first drawn with the late Virgil Duff in 2008, with the promise of completion in 2009. My deepest thanks go to Doug Hildebrand, who not only assured me on many occasions that the contract would be honored, but helped in every regard to ensure that the process of organizing things along the way went as smoothly as possible. And I need to acknowledge Curtis Fahey for his kind editing of the manuscript, and Judy Dumlap for the superb index. My deepest thanks go to Margaret Ash. The book is based on experiences we have shared together and represents the fruits of our considered reflections on them over 50 years. Her hand was crucial in helping to hone the writing to make it as clear as it possibly could be. And finally, a quick word about the topic. The citation indicates it is hard, I would have said impossible, to think of a more important domestic issue for Canadians than that of the relationship between settlers and indigenous peoples, or those who were already here when we first arrived. It is my hope that the matters considered in this book, and particularly the history of our treaty relationship, will offer support to those who seek to move that relationship into a better and more just place. Thank you very much. Le lauréat du Prix du Canada en sciences sociales 2015 est Dominique Perron pour l'Alberta autophage, identité, mythe et discours de pétrole dans l'Ouest canadien, publié par Univers University of Calgary Press. Un extrait de commentaire de jury. Fouillé, rigoureux et opinionnaire, 
l'essai de Dominique Perron offre une analyse pénétrante des contradictions identitaires de l'Alberta pétrolifière. Cet ouvrage arrive à un moment opportun où l'économie albertaine vit une grave crise, conséquence de la chute des cours pétroliers mondiaux. Le livre de Dominique Perron nous pousse à réfléchir sur la précarité d'une industrie qui comporte à la fois son lot de richesses et d'infortunes. Les finalistes pour ce prix incluaient Frédéric Bastien, « Tout le monde en regarde », la politique, la journal, le journalisme et l'infodivertissement à la télévision québécoise, publié par les presses de l'Université Laval. Jean-Pierre Delaurier pour les groupes communautaires vers un changement de paradigme, publié par les presses de l'Université Laval. Et Géraldine Mossière pour « Converti à l'islam, parcours de femmes au Québec et en France » publié par les presses de l'Université de Montréal. Dominique, euh, veuillez venir à l'avant pour accepter votre prix. Félicitations. Voilà. C'est un immense honneur, très inattendu pour moi, que d'être distingué par la Fédération des sciences, des sciences humaines. Mon livre a été rejeté trois fois <rire> par ASPP PES. Chaque fois, j'ai dû le réécrire, avec un résultat, je pense, qui a pu satisfaire la Fédération. Je l'en remercie. Comme vous pouvez l'imaginer, mon livre... est l'objet de certaines polémiques. Il a été aussi l'objet de certains obstacles institutionnels. Le fait de le soumettre à la Fédération des sciences humaines et à son processus rigoureux de revue par les pairs aide ce livre et l'analyse qui y est faite à le maintenir au-dessus des discussions ou des contestations qui pourrait venir du monde non académique. Il est très important au Canada et au Québec en ce moment que la question de l'exploitation de nos ressources naturelles et de notre territoire et de la perte de plus en plus grande de souveraineté dans tous les sens du terme que nous avons sur nos ressources naturelles, nos territoires et les dommages que cela cause au peuple des Premières Nations, soit l'objet d'analyses universitaires et intellectuelles du plus grand niveau et du plus haut niveau possible. Je suis extrêmement reconnaissante à la Fédération d'avoir couronné ce livre qui est aussi, qui était jusque-là le livre de la, fin de, la, de la fin de ma carrière. Vous m'avez donné le courage maintenant de commencer un autre livre en espérant le soumettre encore à SPP Paez, d'être rejeté, de le réécrire. Je n'oublierai jamais cette soirée. Et je vous remercie de tout mon cœur. Now, I would like to congratulate all the winners for 2015, both for having won and for having so impressively maintained the standards of the Canada Prizes and the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Scholarship is so often a challenging struggle, authorship always so, and to do so in ways that give deeper meaning to our culture and society is a supremely important achievement. 
I also want to add my praise for the work of the Federation, the organizers of Canada Prizes, and to thank all of you who are here to support this very important national effort of learning. This concludes tonight's ceremony. Thank you all very, very much for coming.